All right, y'all ready for the word? If you're ready for the word, say it with your chest. Let's go. Put it in tight. Put it in the whatever, the chat. Let's go. Hey, they say let's go. We can't go without y'all. We are Zion Music. Give me that theme music. of this series. I'm just going to have y'all play that song whenever I preach, just, just to make it sound right. Amen. All right, if you have access to the Bible, I'm in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 today. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, if you have it and you want to follow along in the Word with me, you can turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And if you are physically able to stand without harming yourself or somebody near you, please join us in standing. Amen. Amen. Steph and Isha, praise the Lord. Good to see y'all. All right. First Thessalonians chapter 5. Tell somebody I'm glad you made it to church today. Zelo. Just got it. Oh, yeah, somebody's a spy. <laughs> Amen. First Thessalonians chapter 5. Before I read this passage, I'm going to read verses 19 to 24 to you. I'm going to do something different. I'm going to give you my subject before I read the passage. Here's my subject Let God work. Yeah, you feel me? Let God work. Let God work. Say that with me. Let God work. Again, let God work. One more time. Let God work. Okay, I'm scheduled to preach. I need you to preach for like five seconds. I just want you to look at somebody right next to you. Just pick somebody and do it and look them in the eye and just say, let God work. Let God work. Yeah, let him work. Let him work. Let God work. He wants to work. Let him work. Let him work. Amen. Amen. Let me read this passage to you, and hopefully it'll make sense. Verse 19 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Do not stifle the Holy Spirit. Don't, don't, don't suppress the Holy Spirit. Don't, don't hinder the Holy Spirit. The old King James says, don't quench the Holy Spirit. Instead, we should do what? Let God. Let God work. Let him work. Next verse, verse 20. Do not scoff at prophecies. Don't minimize the value of prophecy, but instead do what? Let, God work. Let God work. Yeah. In verse 20, 21, even though we shouldn't scoff at prophecy, let God work, but test everything that is said. <laughs> Hold on to what is good, verse 22, and stay away from every kind of evil. Verse 23 says, now may the God of peace make you holy in every way. Somebody say, let God work. Yeah, yeah that too. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. Let God work. Somebody say it. God will make this happen for he who calls you is faithful. And all of God's people said, let God work. Amen. Before you're seated, let's pray. Father, we pray now that the perfect teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit would be ours today in abundance. Make us alert right now. Quicken our thinking. If, even if we haven't had coffee today, perk us up. Make us attuned to your word. Block out all distractions so that we get everything out of this teaching that you want for us. In Jesus' name. And everybody that agrees said amen. 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 You may be seated. <laughs> Let God work. It is clear in this passage that there are a number of things that God wants to do. Now think about that when it says what God wants to do, but we have to let God do it. Let God work. Now that sounds a bit oxymoronic when you think about who we're talking about. We're talking about God. How are you going to let God do something as if he's a child? I'm going to let you play with your toy for 30 minutes. I'm going to let you go outside until it's dark. God is God. How in the world do we have the power to let him do anything? How in the world do we have the authority to hinder him? Right on, King Jesus. 
No man, ooh, y'all ain't old school in here, cannot hinder thee. How did we get the authority and the audacity and the capability of hindering the work of God? How do we get the prerogative to decide what we're going to let him do? Do you understand what I'm, do you understand the enigmatic nature of letting God do something since he's God? And there's a real simple answer why that is the way it is. It's because of one word, volition, free will. God has given every human being something called choice. We have the choice to allow him to move in our lives. We have the choice to resist him. We have the choice to open up areas of our life to him. We have the choice to keep him close. God is a gentleman. He won't barge in. Think about it. If I say to you, if, if you say to me, uh, and I go over your house, and you say to me, uh, make yourself at home, that's what you say because that's what we say, but you don't really mean that. <laughs> so I make myself at home, walk around my drawers. I'm going in the kitchen, and I'm going to drink out the juice bottle so when nobody looking, and then put the juice bottle back on. Y'all ain't going to talk to me. I'm, a, I'm going in the bedroom. I'm going in the master bedroom. That's where I sleep. You didn't mean that. When you say make yourself at home, you mean stay right here. We'll bring you something to drink. Don't you move in here. Go to that bathroom right there. Do not go up those steps, and do not open this door. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about right here? I didn't make yourself at home just mean take your shoes off but keep them socks on because I know your situation. <laughs> and I'm saying we do God just like that. You can work right here, but don't, no, 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 no. Work in my business, God. Send me some clients, but don't mess with this little relationship I'm in. Oh, I don't want you over here. I don't want you in my sex life. That's personal because I'm grown. But please heal my mother. Y'all ain't, oh, I'm, we compartmentalize him. We send him places, Pastor Green, that we want him to go, not where we need him to be. Ooh, yeah, yeah. Hey, hey, no, does he have all access? Does he have all access to our lives? Or is he compartmentalized? So when, the, when, when, when I say in my subject, let God work. There, see, see, the more surrendered you are, the more room he has to work in your life. The less surrendered you are, the more, the more, the, the limited space he has within the world. Am I making sense to y'all right now? So, so when it comes to this matter of God moving in our lives, it has a lot to do with how much, how much access he gives us and how much access we give him. And in this passage, he starts off in verse 19 and verse 20 by saying, there are two places that I want to work, but I need you to let me. And he brings them up by telling us what not to do. He says, first of all, do not do not quench the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit, let me, let me do some teaching today. There's going to be a lot of teaching, a lot of Bible verses, but hey, that's, you ready for this. So the Holy Spirit is one of the three persons in the Godhead, in the Trinity. God has a triune nature. It is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Those are three distinct persons. They are co-equal. They are co-eternal. They have equal divine nature. That they have different functions. The Father draws people to himself. The Son sacrifices life and dies. And the Holy Spirit, when we accept the Son, enters into our life. He fills us and he guides us and he directs us. So the Holy Spirit of God is a person of God. It's not a thing. And he says, Paul is saying, do not stifle the Holy Spirit. The word in Greek means to extinguish. It is a firefighter term. It is what firefighters do to a, to a fire. And that's why I like the old King James, which says, don't quench it, the Holy Spirit. Because the Bible describes the Holy Spirit metaphorically sometimes as a fire. For example, in Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, when, when John the Baptist was preparing the way for Jesus' ministry, he says, I know y'all think highly of me, but there's something, somebody coming after me. He's so great, I can't even be a slave. I can't even hold his sandals. He says, I baptize you with water. He's going to baptize you with fire and the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, verse 3, the Bible says on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit descended like cloven tongues of fire. And his work as fire means he warms us and he corrects us and he purifies us like a refiner. What a refiner does when somebody goes into, a miner goes into a coal mining situation or a, a place where precious metals are found and they bring the, 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 the precious metals to the refiner, the refiner then sees something that is covered with dross and covered with dirt and covered with debris that, is, that only has potential. 
It has no value, extreme value, until it is cleaned off and burnt off. And the refinery used fire to burn off the dross and, and fuller soap and, a, and, and scrape off the dirt. And the, the refiner only knows when the material is ready, when enough dirt and debris have been burnt off, that the refiner starts seeing his reflection in the metal. <laughs> so here's what God says. I, I, I know where you came from. And there's a lot of that still on you. <laughs> and so what I do is by my spirit, I burn that off of you. And I purge that off of you. And I clean that off of you. And you keep saying, yeah, but that's my family of origin. That's generational to me. This is where I'm from. This is who I am. He says, no, I'm not trying to make you like where you're from. I'm trying to make you more like me. <laughs> and until I can scrape enough off you that you start looking like and talking like and acting like me, that's it. now you're looking like me. Somebody say, let God work. So you got to let God work on you. See, when, when a lot of people in church here don't quench the Holy Spirit, we think that's talking about the worship service. And don't, let, and don't, don't stop the praise. No, let's run around. Let's have a high time. We think that's only talking about church service, Pastor Green. But actually, when God says don't quench the Holy Spirit, he's also talking about our life. It's not just gifts that he's talking about not quenching. He's talking about fruit that he's talking about not quenching. So the Holy Spirit, Brother McCullough, is not just talking. The Holy Spirit is not just moving through gifts in the service. He's also moving in our homes. So don't, don't, don't quench him when he, go, when, he, when he nudges you and say, why don't you go say you're sorry? That's the Holy Spirit too. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ain't nobody shouting on that. Have you ever been to a church that was highly active? It was just a bunch of stuff going on. And like, we ain't going to quench the spirit. People run around falling out and everything. And that's, that's wonderful. But those same people go to work and don't speak to people. And I'm saying the same Holy Spirit that has you running around speaking in tongues and falling out and slapping people, he can't make you nice. You got the gift but no fruit. That's why people at your job don't want to go to your church. Ooh, let me get out y'all business. Excuse me. Let me, come, let me come back here where it's safe. So when he says, I don't want you to quench the Holy Spirit, I don't want you to pour fire on the Holy Spirit, he's not just talking about on the presence of God that moves in service, he's talking about the presence of God that moves in your home and on your job and makes you do the right thing, the promptings and the whispers. Because your behavior can quench the Holy Spirit too. In fact, Ephesians 4.30 says that we can grieve the Holy Spirit by the way we live. In fact, if you pay attention to a person whose life was on fire for God and they cooled off, I'll guarantee you the cool off is connected to sin. How many people admit the sin will cool you right off? You're like, man, I used to be walking with the Lord, reading the scriptures and everything, and now you're real calm with it? People don't know whether it's private or public, sin will cool off the Spirit of God in your life. Are we together? Now, here's what he says. He says, he says first of all, don't quench the Holy Spirit. Don't suppress it. Don't, 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 um, don't stifle it. Don't stop it. Don't put his fire out. And what I want you to see is, is he's trying to do it not just in, in, in the service, but in our lives. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul is going to talk about spiritual gifts in chapter 12. He talks about spiritual gifts all of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, especially he spends a lot of time talking about speaking in tongues. When he gets to chapter 13, verse 1, he says, if I could speak all the languages of the earth and of angels, if I was the best tongue speaker ever, but didn't love others, watch that. The first part of the sentence is the gift. The second part is the fruit. He says, if I could speak all kinds of tongues, that's the gift, but didn't love others, that's the fruit. Because the fruit of the Spirit is peace, joy, love, peace, joy, suffering, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness, faithfulness, patience, self-control. He says, if I don't have the fruit, I would only be a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. Verse 2, watch this. If I had the gift of prophecy, another gift. And if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, that's the gift but didn't love others, that's the fruit, I'd be nothing. Go to verse 3. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it, but if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Do you see the distinction he's making between the charisma and the character? In the Greek language, gifts are charisma, charisma. He's saying there's a difference between being gifted and being godly. There's a difference between having the gift and having the fruit. Do y'all see the distinction? Yeah. 
And the reason why the church is so messed up is because we got a lot of gifted people, but they're not godly. So you're anointed and you're annoying at the same time. And the reason why you're annoying while you're anointed is because you went for the gift, but you skipped the fruit. So you wanted the power of God, but you didn't get the personality of God. Ooh, let me talk to you. A lot, of, a lot of people in church look like, you know those refreshment tables at, at events? All refreshment tables at events look the same, BJ. They all look the same. You have potato chips and cookies and junk on the table, and then every now and then, they'll have a little healthy little tray or something. And like some fruit, like it'd be like some old dried grapes that ain't been rinsed off and be a couple of pieces of pineapple in there. But they never had to replenish that. The cookies and the potato chips, they got to keep bringing the bags back out because most people will skip the fruit to get to the chip. Mm, that's so good right there. Did you get that? See the, reason, see, the reason why you are a trip is because you skip the fruit to get to the chip. Ooh, that's good. Bars. See, you wanted to have power of God, but you, don't have, but you don't have the personality of God. That's why people don't like you. And this is what God is saying here. Don't quench my spirit, not just in, 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 in demonstration, but don't quench my spirit because of your disobedience in your life. This is all important. So he said, let them work. Everybody said, let them work. So no, God, don't just work on my gift. Work on my righteousness. Work on my conduct. And the way God speaks to us personally is not the way, it's not a fire, it's a whisper. Like, it's the promptings of God. Like, God will just say something to you. That's why your life has to be spiritually quiet enough to hear the promptings. God will say, look at your wife over there watching this. Why don't you go try them? And you'd be like, I know that wasn't God right there. I know that. that was definitely God. Let me go to the next thing. Verse 20, he says, Let, here's how I want you to work. You need the Holy Spirit for this too. Let God work prophetically. Don't scoff at prophecies. The gift of prophecy in the Bible, what are we going with? Prophecy is a biblical gift that manifests itself in two ways. So it is a spiritual gift Part of the spiritual gift of prophecy is the ability to predict future things. It is to be able to foretell. With the help of God, a person can predict or foretell future events as God gives them insight. That is a prophetic gift. The same Greek word is used for somebody who actually foretells the word of God or preaches. It's the same Greek word. I am, I, have the, I am using my prophetic gift to preach right now. It is, so and this, this one predicts the will of God. This one interprets the will of God using the scriptures. Now, I've never seen somebody who could do this who couldn't do that. If you can, if you can predict the future, the prophetic gift is so married that people who can prophesy about the future can also preach the truth of the Bible. That's, that's how the gift works. And here's what was going on in Thessalonica. They were scoffing at this gift. They were minimizing the gift, saying, we don't need that. And no, we're never told why they had a problem with prophecy. My guess is, is that like with us, anytime a gift is abused and used abusively on you, you don't want nothing to do with it. You know how people like manipulate? People have been manipulated to this day with the gift of prophecy. Saying, give me this money and in seven days you're going to get a house. Seven days you're going to get a spouse. You know? But that person who told you that, they will be gone in two days <laughs> to the next city. But you got to wait seven days after you gave them your money. And then you sitting there. So you, it happens. That's why the Bible says in verse 21 and 22, you got to test it. Don't just accept it, but don't reject it. Just listen to it, but then test it. So people have been, and I, people don't just, aren't just abused by the foretelling gift. People are abused by, by the foretelling or predicting gift of prophecy. Some people have been abused by preaching. Pulpits that are, that, are, that are abusive, that punish people and make people come under their control. You see, whenever you've experienced an abuse of a gift, you don't want no parts of it. So it must have been going on in the church of Thessalonica. So Paul says, first of all, don't scoff at it. It is a gift from God. Let me work in that space, but make sure you're examining it. Now, he said, let me go deeper in this. The reason why I wanted to explain to you the twofold nature of this gift is because before the Bible was completed, prophecy 
was the main way that God spoke to his people. So in the Old Testament, in the first century, before we had what Acts 20 and 27 calls the whole counsel of God in written form, God would speak to his people directly through prophets. That's how people got revelation about what God, what God was up to. But once God's will was put in, in writing, the need for prophetic utterances like that diminished. They don't disappear, but they're less necessary because we have the whole counsel of God. Are you following me? Now, so now... Now, let me, let, me, let me say something else. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, I want to talk about this gift because it should be celebrated. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, he says, this is Paul talking, let love be your highest goal. That's fruit. But you should also desire the special abilities the Spirit gives. It's okay to want to have a spiritual gift. In fact, God gives everybody one, especially the ability to prophesy. Verse 2, for if you have the ability to speak in tongues, you will be talking only to God, since people won't be able to understand you. You'll be speaking by the power of the Spirit, but it will always be mysterious. Go to verse 3, but one who prophesies strengthens others, encourages them, and comforts them. Oh, stop right there. Here's one of the ways you can examine a prophecy that's from God. Does it strengthen? Does it encourage? Does it comfort? That's one of three things you can look for, three of, three of some of the things you can look for when, to, to, to examine a prophecy. Verse four, a person who speaks in tongues is strengthened personally, but one who speaks a word of prophecy strengthens the entire church. Y'all with me? Verse five, I wish you could all speak in tongues, but, but even more, I wish you could all prophesy. For prophecy is greater than speaking in tongues unless someone interprets what you are saying so that the whole church will be strengthened. Verse six, dear brothers and sisters, if I should come to you speaking in an unknown language, how would that help you? But if I bring you a revelation or some special knowledge or prophecy or teaching, that will be helpful. So here's the deal. The goal of prophecy, whether it's preaching or predicting, is to help the body of Christ. Are y'all with me? Don't ignore it. Don't dis Some people don't even want to. In fact, one of the problems that, that we find out about this church in particular is in Acts chapter 17, verse 11, where the writer of Acts compares the church of Thessalonica to the church of Berea. Go to Acts 17, 11. This is how we get more insight. It says the people of Berea were more open-minded than those in Thessalonica. Watch this. They listened eagerly to Paul's message. So when Paul was preaching, whether it was predicting something or just teaching something that was already written, they were open-minded. They listened eagerly. Watch this. Then it says they searched the scriptures day after day to see if Paul and Silas were teaching the truth. Watch this now. This is the difference. See, they said they were better than the church of Thessalonians. The Thessalonian church obviously was less open-minded to prophecy, and they were too lazy to search the scriptures to see whether or not the prophet was telling the truth. They were just, because when you've been wounded, you don't want to hear none of it. You got your favorite preacher. That's the only preacher you listen to. Some of y'all, you only listen to one preacher. You only, you only come to church when he's preaching, and you only turn on the TV when he's on because everybody else done offended you. And you got one person you trust. You got to grow up out of that. You have to grow up even out of your hurt to say that more than one person can speak to you from God. And they didn't, they didn't go and say, and here's what, Paul, here's what Paul is saying here. Check all of it though. Test all of it. Paul, Silas, Keith and them, everybody need to be tested. <laughs> go back to 1 Corinthians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse, 20, verse uh, 21. It says, even though we shouldn't scoff at prophecies, test everything that's said. Right. The Bible says, Dad, try every spirit. Yeah. All of it. Everybody got to be on trial. Give me 1 first, first, first John 4. 1 John 4, 1 says, Dear friends, do not believe everyone that claims to speak by the Spirit. You must test them to see if the Spirit they have comes from God. For there are many false prophets in the world. That was written 2,000 years ago. Right? So now we deal with the same thing today, 2,000 years later, a world full of false prophets. Yeah. And you, the reason why we don't trust it is because we had some, you know, you know y'all know people who hear from God all the time. And I don't just mean hear from God all the time about themselves. I'm talking about hear from God all the time about you. <laughs> See, I can buy that. If God speaks to you all the time about everything, God bless you. If he tells you, I want you to pull the toilet paper up. Now, don't pull it down today. I want you to pull it up because I'm pulling you up. And that's how you're going Use the toilet paper. That's beautiful. I just got a problem with you always hearing from God about me and other people. 
That's manipulative. It's not that you can't get a word from somebody else. How many, if I say, God told me to tell you quit your job and trust them. You can't be reckless with people's lives like that. You quit your job and trust them. <laughs> Let me say how that works for you. Then I'll follow you as you follow Christ. <laughs> Some people are just reckless, acting like these ain't people with real lives. People leaving their families, as some of the, the prophets said. That's reckless. But it is, but guess what? It ain't. God can hold the prophet responsible, but he's gonna hold you responsible. He said, you better test it. You got the Bible to test it. That's why you gotta know the Bible. You gotta know enough of the Bible said, that don't that don't nah. 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 I told y'all when I worked here at Kmart, they they never showed when we, we were doing cashier when I was a cashier. This is before the little marker came out where you could check fake money. And I asked the manager, why you don't, why, why do you don't show us fake money? He said, we don't train you that way. He says, we show you so much real money that when you see fake money, it'll stand out. Wow. So we just became adept at, at knowing what real money looked at, looked like. Are you see what I'm saying? You got to get so familiar with the truth that when something that ain't true hits you, it just don't, it's just something that nah, ain't, don't, nah, man. Nah, nah, I'm good. I don't care how loud they are. They can shake and say, oh, excuse me, like the Holy Spirit. No, no, test everybody. And you test it for two things, verse 21 and 22. I'm almost done. Test for two things. First of all, you test, go back to 1 Thessalonians 5, 20. I'm sure, I know I'm dropping around. 1 Thessalonians 5, 21. First of all, you test it to see if it's good. If it's good, you hold on to it. Now, by good, it's, it doesn't mean it feels good. Or it sounds good. It can, be, it can be a promotion or it can be a correction. The question is, is it good? Is it good for the family of God? The second thing he says, he's still talking about prophecy. In verse 22, he says, but if it's evil, stay away from it. If it's harmful, if it's hurtful, don't mess with it. All right? Now, I'm almost done. Here's the last thing he says in verse 23. He says, I got verse 24 too. In verse 23, he says, now may the God of peace make you holy in every way make you holy in every way. <laughs> yeah. God wants to make us holy in every way. Now understand, every person that has a personal relationship with God, you've invited God into your life to be your savior. There's a level of holiness inside of you. There's a measure of holiness that comes with receiving his divine nature. The moment you accept Christ as your savior, the divine nature in you wakes up and there's a level of holiness that all of us have. But how many of you would admit that you are not holy in every way? <laughs> now, go ahead and put your hand up before I know what the area of unholiness you... <laughs> I got some ways that are not holy. But here's what he says. God's goal is to make you holy in every way. In every way. Now, here's the beauty of it. He's not just, you got to let him work. Because he says, he doesn't say, you got to get here on your own. He doesn't say, that's the night in church, get holy. He says, make God himself make you holy. The God of peace, may he make you holy. In every I'm so great. Lord, y'all don't know how much of a relief that is. It's a relief to know that I don't have to get to a place of holiness on my own. God will help me become holy if I let him work. I got to let him work. I got to uncompartmentalize my life. See, you already, we already know where the areas where he needs to work as those are the areas that are least holy. But we keep making excuses for still being like that. I'm saying, how are you, how are you, that, how are you have that much access to a pure God and you still the same? That means all you wanted was enough God to go to heaven. You don't want to be transformed on earth. You just want the blessings, but not the transformation. So it is a transactional relationship with you. And we hate other people doing transactional relationships with us, but your relationship with God is transactional because you only want from him what you want, but you don't want him to transform you. And I'm saying it's a, tra it's, it's a poor testimony to know God and not be changing. That's a bad testimony. You done came into the light of the world and you still dark. I ain't talking about complexion. I'm talking about life. Mm. But it's not just on God. Go to 1 Thessalonians 4. Am I doing too many scriptures for y'all today? <laughs> I don't care. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I want to show you. It's not. See, getting, becoming holy is a partnership. God, let God work. Say what? Let God work. 
but I got to let them. It's a partnership. So here's my part. First Thessalonians said, God's will is for you to be holy. That's his will. Watch what he tells me to do. Stay away from sexual sin. All of it. Ha, ha. <laughs> you, you, you all over there, God. I'll tell you, you know, we trying to talk about clients in my business. You know what I'm saying? I'm trying to talk, can you heal my mama now? <laughs> what you got to do? Uh, you got to stay away from sexual sin. You got to stay away from it. So if you know going down that aisle and going down that street and going into that environment and opening up that page, like you, you're going the wrong way. So we got to work together. Yeah. Verse four, ooh, it's going to be real quiet through these little sections right here. Then each of you will control, watch this, control his own body. Yeah. I'll help you. I'm always here yeah. and live in holiness and honor. Yeah, help us, Lord. Everybody say, help us, Lord. Not in lustful passions like the pagans who do not know God in his ways. He says, I expect more from you because y'all got me in you. I don't, I don't expect pagans to do any of this. See, the very fact that you're here lets me know that you have, the very, whether you watch it on TV or on radio or you some, or one of our campuses, the fact that you have assembled in a place like this in a time like this lets me know that you have an interest in God working in your life. That lets me know. So, he, so let him work. Say it for me. Let him work. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Verse 6. Never harm or cheat a fellow believer in this matter by violating his wife. For the Lord avenges all such sins, and we have solemnly warned you before. I know you're saying, but we're soulmates. We were always meant to be. Mm. The devil will give you all kinds of justification for stuff that's not right. And then we put that over here. So we're, you know what it means to have integrity? Let me define integrity for you. Integrity means to be congruent. It is integrated. That's integrity. It literally means to be integrated, to be all one. Most of us, our lives are disintegrated. So we got, we got, our, we got our private life where we do us. I just do me. Then we got our spiritual life, and we got our business life. That's disintegrated. If God is God, shouldn't my private activities and my business and my relationships, all of it is in alignment? So stop saying you got integrity. You have some. But he says, I want it all. I want to make you holy in every way. Let me go back to the verse. Some of y'all are getting real... You, you're starting to squirm a little. <laughs> Go to verse 7. Go to verse 7. God has called us to live holy lives, not impure lives. One more verse. Therefore, anyone who refuses to live by these rules is not disobeying human teaching. You're rejecting God who gives. It is. He's giving you help. He's giving you his Holy Spirit. Let God. Let it work. He says, I want to help you. I want to help you be successful. And Philippians 2.13 says, it is God who works in us both the will and the do of his good pleasure. Let, let's go back. Let's go back. I'm almost done. 1 Thessalonians 5.23. You're doing so good. Is that Jules back there? Whoever's doing my slides, you're killing it today. I'm all over the place and you're keeping up with me. Thank you so much. You'd be surprised at how many little things have to happen behind the scenes for this all the work. Thank you. May the God of peace make you holy in every way in your spirit and your soul and your body. So just like God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, he is triune, we are triune. We're spirit, soul, and body. And look at how he lists them in the order of priority. Your spirit is most important. Your soul is next important. Your body is the least important thing that you have. Let's talk about each one. He says, I want you to be holy in your spirit. Your spirit, when you're holy, your spirit is the part of you, by the way, that was dead until you got saved. For Ephesians 1 says that we were, we were all dead in trespasses and sin. And then the Spirit of God made us alive. Do you understand? There's a spiritual resurrection that happens when we get saved. That is unbelievable. It is unbelievable how we got saved. Like he brought us from death to life. And once your spirit is made alive, that is a part of you that connects to God. It is a part of you that hears from God. It is a part of you receive gifts from God. It is, that, that is the most important part of who you are, your spirit. Then your soul is your human internal operating system. It is a part of you that feels and yearns and lusts and strives. It is your emotional center. 
and then your body is the least important part of you. The first two parts of you, your soul and your spirit, are eternal. They never die. Even when it leaves your body, they go somewhere forever. Your body is temporal. Your body will not go to heaven. Flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. God has to give us new bodies. We move from terrestrial bodies, 1 Corinthians 15 says, to celestial bodies in order to go to heaven. So this body is temporary. It is running out of time. You have to understand, most of us think of age in the wrong direction. We think, man, you're getting up there, getting up in age. That's not how it works. You're running out of time. The moment we enter this earth in a body, the clock is counting down. And if you got 68 years or 72 years or 34 years, the moment you were born, if you got 78 years, the moment you come out into this world in your body, you now have 77 years, 11 months, 29 days, 24, 23 hours and 59 minutes and 59 seconds. What if we all had a clock saying, this is all you got left? If all you got is six years left, it would change the way you live. And if you're 24 years old and you got six years left, you are older than somebody who's 84 that's got 10 years left. The oldest person in the room is not the person who's lived the longest. The oldest person in the room is the person who has the least amount of time left. And from there, you go into eternity forever. And I'm saying the body is the least important part of it because it's running out of time. And your body will tell you without even asking it, it will let you know it's not permanent. When you start having to make noises to get in and out of cars, <laughs> I used to laugh at people. Then I'd be hearing myself, dang, that's how I just made all them noises. <laughs> when I say, let's stand for the reading of the word, you'd be like, okay, here we go. <laughs> yep. Some of y'all laughing. It ain't going to be simple after a while. How many, you go to sleep, you can, it is possible to go to sleep when you get older and you went to sleep and you were relatively in very little pain. You wake up and something ain't working. You be like, how in the world did I pop my Achilles in my sleep? How many people know it's like you can wake up and something like, what in the world? This arm won't move. <laughs> That's your body telling you, I ain't permanent. I'm temporary. This is your earth suit. Ooh, that's so good. That's your earth suit. It's just what you walk around in. It's just our way of a dinner. It's your envelope. It's just your envelope. When you go to a funeral, what's laying in the casket is the envelope. It's the earth suit. You, you can dress it up, paint it up. It's just an earth suit. It's, no, let me tell you something. You have never opened an envelope when it came in the mail and the envelope was more important than the contents in the envelope. I don't even care about the envelope. It's what, y'all so what I'm trying to tell you is, yeah, work out. Yeah, eat right. But if you spend more time on something that's dying and you're spending less time on what's going to last forever, so now you're physically fit, but you're spiritually immature. That's not, how are you going to justify that? Some people working out right now, not in, I ain't judging you for not being in church, but how did that become more important? Do the best you can with your body. I ain't mad at you. But don't be physically fit and spiritually sick. I'm out of time. Let me do this. What's the subject today? Let me hear you in Fort Washington. What's the subject? Mm -hmm. How do you let them work? Y'all stand with me. Sure, I've been staying the whole time. You let them work just by asking them. Lord, help me. That's a simple prayer right there. Lord, help me. He knows what all that is, what's left out. You can be as specific as you want. What, what, here's where I want you to help me. Here's what I want you to help me. Here's how I want you to help me. But if you just say, Lord, help me. It's like this. If you've ever watched a child struggle with something, and you know when they get to that age, they don't want no help. They want to do it themselves. And you sitting there, you can see the problem. And you want so bad because you help to see it. You hate to see your child struggle. But you have to have permission to help them. So just like with your child, we're his children. And if your child just says to you, you see what they're struggling with, you see what they're working on, and they just look at me and say, can you help me? You say, it'd be my pleasure. You only have to tell me what you want. I've been seeing you. I know what you. 
I know how to fix this. When you say to God, just help me, he would, it's my pleasure. I've been waiting. I've been standing at the door and knocking. You got to open the door and let me in. That's how our relationship started. God didn't even force you to have a relationship with him. So I stand at the door and knock. I'll give you a powerful example. When Jesus was dying on the cross, there were two people next to him, one on one side, one on the other. They both had the same proximity, same opportunity, but they both had choice. One chose to his dying breath to mock Jesus. The other one started getting on the other one saying, you need to stop talking about him. He don't deserve to be here. Then he said, Lord, when you get to your kingdom, he didn't even pray the right prayer. He didn't say uh, the ABC prayer, the sinner's prayer. He just said, remember me. He said, that's all I need to hear. You're going to be with me in paradise because of your choice. I'm here to save both of y'all, but the only one get it is the one who chooses. That's how it works. That's how it works. Everybody say, Lord, help me. That's how you let them work. And let me tell you the areas where you know you need them to work is the ones that stress you the most. Tension is a revelation of inability and incapacity. Like, I'm under, I'm under capacity here. And we just grind and hard. God can show you. I, I, I can help you with that. I know all things. Am I making sense to y'all today? Sit back down. I'm going to close the service out like this. I'm going to turn the service over. Because some of y'all, y'all got this pattern. When I pray, y'all leave. But the service ain't over. So I ain't going to let you, ain't going to get me with that. So I'm going to turn the service over. Right now, Pastor Swan, Fort Washington. Pastor Dondre at Landover. Minister Connor at Zion Woodbridge. Pastor Kevin for Zion Anywhere. I turn the service over to you now to wrap up the service where you are.